Well, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. So today uh, we're going to take a break in the Green's functional formalism uh, that is going to, to continue anyway next week. And we get back to the density functional formalism to talk about uh, TDDFT. Um, I have a couple of um, instruction first. So as you might have already seen, uh, I'm not sharing my screen. So it's up to you individually to put uh, in the in full screen if you want to see the slides. Uh, um, well, full screen. Um, also, I would like to to make it uh, as as interactive as possible uh, this uh, this lecture. Um, so if you're thinking of looking and listening to to the to the lecture without doing anything uh, you will be wrong because you will be asked during this um, during this lecture to participate to some uh, to some uh, survey and to give your opinion in several uh, in several uh, things and so you can already prepare yourself by going with the with the web page in your in your browser or you with your smartphone you can go to this uh, website and you keep it there for the moment the site is called wooklab.com slash well istpc tddft very originally um, and so you will be asked to answer to some question it's not a test of course it's more of a survey. In fact, you don't need to download anything to register to anything. It's just uh, give your uh, your opinion, and uh, and this will reflect on the continuation of the of the of the lecture. Um, and as usual, of course, uh, uh, please uh, ask your question. Use the chat uh, or interrupt me if you really see something that you would like to ask or to comment on. Okay. Um, Good. So today we're going to talk about the time-dependent uh, situation, and we want to apply density functional formalism to a problem in which uh, the system is submitted to an external perturbation that depends on time. The I always like uh, to present this um, this slide because. It um, also represents uh, the, uh, what we are trying to do in this, uh, in this school. That means to present uh, several aspects of the many-body problem to be tackled in different way using, with r 3 we have seen some uh, uh, wave function-based method. Uh, we are seeing at the moment a Green's function-based uh, uh, approach in which the basic quantity is not any longer the uh, many body wave function, a 3n variable, but rather the two um, space variable plus a frequency or a time difference uh, represented by the Green's function, up to the simpler, the simplest of the basic quantity, which is the density. And we have seen this already with Julien uh, in density functional theory. And of course, in the middle, there are other, other situations. Uh, Pina talked about the reduced density matrix uh, functional theory. We could talk about the current density functional theory or uh, um, uh, about dynamical mean field theory, which is also a Green's function based approach in which the Green's function is taken to be local uh, in space, but still dynamical. So we have a, a full uh, set of uh, uh, theories in which uh, the basic quantity changes. And uh, I like to show this um, line here in which the basic quantity becomes simpler and simpler. However, there is a price to pay in order to have in principle, let's say on the paper, a simpler theory. The price to pay is that we have to make uh, stronger and stronger effort in devising approximation to work in this, uh, in this framework in the wave function based formalism in which we have, for example, the many body Schrodinger equation. There is no, or virtually no approximation. We know the interaction term, we know everything. It's just hard to solve. In uh, the opposite side with density functional theory, 
everything is very, very simple on the paper. The Koneshame equation that we uh, devise into the density functional formalists are one particle exact in principle um, equations. Still, we have an unknown and really unknown quantity, the exchange correlation potential, which is very, very difficult to, to find the uh, efficient approximation to. Okay? So, um, I would like immediately to present uh, two textbooks, quite recent, uh, that permits you to go much, much deeper into the details about TDTFT or what we are going uh, to do today. Uh, one is um, the time dependent density functional theory of Karsten Ulrich, and the other, well, fundamentals of TDDFT, which is uh, uh, made by several, several authors. Okay, and here you find everything, I think, starting from the very basic introduction to more advanced uh, topics. In um, DFT, we have already seen that uh, uh, it is still an exploding, still a very um, highly success uh, approach for the many body problem, uh, the number of applications still, uh, still increase in every year, and this uh, is even more so with the recent explosion of the machine learning approach, for which the DFT is very often the basic uh, quantity for, uh, for the training of the, of the machine learning approach. And so this only increase this steep uh, curve about publication that we're gonna have per year on or based on DFT. Okay, and talking about um, application, I would like you to go to this, um, to this website, all of you, and we can start uh, doing uh, the, first, um, the first question that I would like to ask. So this uh, question will last uh, around uh, 30 seconds, 40 seconds to the, to the screen. So you just don't think it too much. Just think, uh, just put what you, what you think. So the question is the following. Which, topic is, which topics do you think we can tackle with TDDFT? Again, it's not a test. Just uh, click on one or more than one that you think we tackle normally with TDDFT. Okay, already a third of participants. So the, the different um, topics mentioned here, I mentioned only eight, I could have mentioned even more, are uh, typical spectra or excitation synergies, um, magnetic excitation, plasmonics, whatever that means, we haven't talked about that, uh, quantum optical control, ground state total energies, why not? Electron ion dynamics, or just see and watch electrons in intense uh, laser fields. Okay, almost there. Remember for the future uh, question uh, that it might be possible that you sort of lose contact with the website. Uh, it's not a problem, just refresh the page uh, and you will see the, the next question in case you don't see it immediately as uh, uh, we see it on the, on the screen. Okay. A few seconds to go. And let's start looking at the results. Okay. So, uh, I, if I look at the, at the results, I see, first of all, very promising uh, answers because uh, no topics has been left, uh, left behind which is indeed the case. All these topics are uh, tackled in a more or less efficient way, in a more or less uh, uh, accurate way from, um, with the TDDFT. Um, and I also see, for example, uh, excitation energies that has been voted basically by all, uh, by all participants. And already I can see, or I can guess, for instance, the, um, the percentage of uh, chemists in the, in, the, in the audience, which is not, is not uh, negligible. That's a guess, of course. Okay, 
let's go to the second questions and uh, and then we we get back to our uh, to our lecture how would you split if i had to ask you to split those um, applications in two categories what will be your uh, your um, um, division, let's say. You, you, how would you do it? Of course, they are all okay. It's just a sort of a question. How would you do it? This uh, this kind of uh, splitting. Okay. You could divide it into ground versus excited state. This is a possible a possible way. Another way could be dividing. Sorry, dividing them in. Uh, perturbative approach versus real-time dependent phenomena. Another could be only electronic versus uh, ionic degrees of freedom or spin degrees of freedom, so divided the, the degrees of freedom. Um, the fourth case here is simple versus complicated approximations required. Of course, for this, uh, you, need a bit, you need to know a bit more, but indeed, you can definitely say that there are some uh, topics that are easy to tackle with the simple uh, approximation and others that will require a very complicated uh, um, uh, approximation to, to be tackled efficiently. And indeed, this is a possibility. And finally, I put something like physics versus chemistry approach. This is uh, something that... Uh, well, it's sort of a boutade in French, a sort of um, uh, provocation. There is no such a thing as phys physics versus chemistry approach, but still, sometimes the, the two communities use similar, but not necessarily the same, the same tools, and so the approach can be indeed different, especially when we compare quantum chemistry approach working on simple molecules and uh, uh, solid state physicist uh, who comes from the homogeneous electron gas, for instance. Okay, so a few, few seconds to go, and let's see the, um, the results here. Okay, the simple one is, of course, ground versus excited state. And indeed, in the previous, in the previous um, question in which the application were mentioned, there were at least uh, a couple of them in that indeed could be divided into either ground or excited states. However, the, for the specific um, topic that we want to talk about today, time-dependent density functional theory, I would like to spend more time in uh, talking about this division time-dependent phenomena versus perturbative approach, because I won't talk a lot about ground state. I will talk about a system driven out of the equilibrium due to the time-dependent um, external perturbation. So we will see how to deal with this, um, this uh, division. But as I said, all these are perfectly valid uh, way to divide the, uh, the, the, the application in, uh, in different categories. Okay, let's get back to our, um, to our lecture. This, um, this uh, uh, set of, um, of um, uh, let's put it here, uh, this um, set of applications, so there were eight. So I would like to divide them into the application in which we can use and this has an important point, we will see this in the second part, uh, in which we can use a perturbative approach. Well, perturbative means that uh, our perturbation in this case is small, and so we can consider as a small variation with respect to the ground state situation, or with respect to an initial situation anyway. And instead, there are applications in which uh, this cannot be done, or not can be done easily, uh, for example, situation in which really the perturbation is time dependent and is always varying during the evolution of the system. In this case, we cannot use 
perturbative approach, at least perturbative in time, and we will have to use a full time-dependent um, evolution of the system. Okay? Good. So, the name of the game. This is the question, this is the problem that we want to solve, and in general, we have the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. As well as we did uh, with the Julien, uh, with, the, um, with the static case, we want to, to transform the problem, the many-body problem, static, of the Schrodinger equation into a, something simpler. We want to do the same thing here, but in which the external potential here doesn't contain only the nuclei, the nuclei position, but also a time-dependent external perturbation. And so this is managed by the uh, time-dependent radical equation. And of course, since it is a dynamic, um, a dynamic problem, this is true not only for the quantum case, this is true also for the classic case, we, don't, we, we need to know not only the evolution, but also the starting point. This is true also for the Newton equation, okay? So we want to translate this into the DFT world, okay? Well, we have some um, hints because we already did it for the density functional theory. We had the hoenberg econ theorem that permits to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between an external potential, a static external potential, and the electron density. And thanks to this one-to-one -one correspondence, we can say that uh, the uh, expectation value of every observable in the ground state is a unique functional of the density. Well, we can say something very similar thanks to another theorem, the Runge-Gross theorem, demonstrated in this, uh, in this um, paper here. We can say that there is a correspondence, unique correspondence between the time-dependent external potential and the time-dependent density. If this is true, then the expectation value any moment in time of an observable is a unique function of the density and of course still depending for a given uh, starting point. This will, will always have it, even if it is not a problem in practice, but we have this uh, um, in principle initial state dependence like all, please note that, like all dynamical uh, problem. So the questions are how we can say that, so is it true? And how do we do in practice? So for the first question, of course, the answer is, well, we have to demonstrate that, okay? And in practice, not surprisingly, we will have some uh, Konecham um, approach, so one particle Konecham approach for dealing with the time-dependent DFT. This is crucial for having a practical solution of the problem, okay? So, um, the uh, demonstration comes in two steps. Uh, at first, we show that if we have two different external potential, the current density are different, and only afterwards demonstrate that uh, also, the density are different. So if two external potential always give two external density, that means that there is a unique correspondence between the external potential and the density. Okay, so the demonstration of the theorem uh, can be important. It's not particularly complicated, actually it's very simple. Um, but uh, it will take us easily 15 minutes, 20 minutes to, to go through it. And so here comes your first work today. You will have to decide if you want to go through the Runge Gross demonstration now, or you prefer to skip it because after all, after all you will see it uh, in, the, in, the, in the resources that I can mention, for example, in the books, 
or because, for example, we might uh, delay it for the very end if we have time. I doubt it because um, actually I prepared a long, uh, a long lecture and uh, there will be bifurcation in our, in our lecture. Uh, and so you have to decide. So you have also this responsibility to decide uh, what, uh, what, uh, which direction we will take with our, with our lecture. Okay. So it seems clear that even if it's not uh, overwhelming, but still the majority wants to go through the, the demonstration. So we don't lose time in this case and we go through the demonstration immediately. Okay, so first step, we have to show that uh, two different external potential. And now here we have to specify what do we mean. So the two potential are to be really different. So they cannot be different by just a purely time dependent constant they have to be really different also in space okay so if two potentials are different they generate two different current density how we demonstrate that well we use the equation of motion for the current density so the equation of motion this is true also in the classical physics is equal to the uh, to the commutator of the current density with the Hamiltonian. Okay, so we have the Hamiltonian H that contain, contains the external potential Vx. <clears throat> and we have another Hamiltonian that contains the potential V prime, and this is called H prime. And also for this, there will be a um, an equation of motion for the current density. And we want to demonstrate that if we have two external potential and we start from the same initial point, which is, for example, psi at t equal zero or at t equal to any point, but for example, let's take zero without loss of generality, we can um, have two different current density. How it is that? Well, we take the difference term by term of these two equations. <clears throat> and we see that the only difference between H and H prime, since the kinetic term and the electron, intera electron electron interaction are universal, the only difference is in the external potential. So this actually H at point zero and H prime at point zero, starting from a certain uh, wave function at t equal zero, this is simply given by the difference of the external potential. And here, since they are all the external potential, the, the current density are one body operator. Here, acting the, the, the expectation value is simply acting to the J that contains the nabla times the delta. The delta taken with the uh, initial state will give you the density at initial state. And we have the nabla that acts on the external potential, the difference of the external potential. So what, this, uh, what does this say? Well, it says that if the two potential, Vx and V prime stack are different at t equals zero, so this will be different from zero. And so this side will be also different from zero. So the two current density will have a different time derivative at t equals zero. Okay, if two potential differ by more than a constant, of course, they will generate two different current density. Let's see this point graphically. Okay, so this is the situation. We have here on the y-axis, we have the potential and in the x-axis, the time. So these are the two potential that are supposed to be different at t equal zero. Here, just a, a caution. Here, we just uh, plot uh, against one dimension, y, the value of vx. The vx is still a function of in, in space. So it's a grid, a full grid in R. So it's not just one point. It's a function of R in the, in the y-axis, OK? So we say that if two potential are different at t equal 0, well, they will produce two different density, current density, sorry. Why? Because maybe the current density might even be equal at t equals zero, but since the first time derivative will be different, they will diverge. 
an infinitesimal point afterwards, we will have different current density. And so the current density are different. Okay? Of course, uh, this cannot be the full story. Because here, what we have just demonstrated is that uh, if two potentials are different, are z in zero, they produce different, different current density. But this is not the whole story. Because, of course, you can have two different external potential that happens to be equal at e equal zero. For example, these are clearly two different external potential that happens that happens to be equal at e equal zero. Well, in that case, this what we have demonstrated so far wouldn't hold. We couldn't be able to say that these two different external potential will give a different current density. But uh, these two potentials have the same value in zero, but they have something different in zero. What is this? Exactly, it is the time derivative. Their slope is completely different in t equals zero for the blue and the red curve. So in zero, they are the same, but they have a different time derivative. How can we exploit that? Well, we can if we continue doing this uh, equation of motion business. Now we take the equation of motion, not of j, but of the commutator j and h. And uh, the commutator of j and h, we remember from the previous case, it was given the time derivative of the current density. So we can put it. Sorry, here. So if we put here the current time derivative, we will have a second time derivative with respect to time of the current density, both for the h case, for the first uh, potential, and for the second potential. And then we do again the difference term by term of these two cases. We use the previous result and we'll obtain that the second time derivative of the current density at t equal t0 is given again by the uh, the density at the initial point, the nabla, but now we have, uh, because we, remind, we remember this was related to the time evolution, we have time derivative of the difference of the external potential at t equal zero. Okay? So now, if the potential have different time derivative at zero, they will produce different current density. For sure. So if we get back to our graph as before, we will have different derivative at zero for the potential. Well, what we will have for our um, current density, they might be equal at equal zero. They might also have the same time derivative at equal zero, but the second time derivative will be different. And so again, they will diverge after a certain moment. And so we will have two different current density. Now, of course, we have to extend this, but now we understood the trick, right? This is the case in which the two potential are, have different time derivative in zero. But it can also happen that the two potential have the same time derivative in zero. But maybe they will have the second time derivative difference from zero. So the point here being that if these two potential Vx and V prime x are really different, that was our hypothesis, there must be a finite time derivative in which they are different, because otherwise they will be the same. So if at a certain moment exists a k from which these two are different, then the k plus one time derivative of the current density will be different. And so the current density will diverge. And with this, we have demonstrated the first part of the Runge-Gross uh, theorem. Two different potential will generate two different current density. Okay? Here, you might have noticed that I used something. It's not totally general. Is it? it is quite general. Because I would like to mention that, for example, here, never I use the fact that my starting point has to be something specific. I just has to be a starting point. It has not to be a, the ground state starting point. Not at all. 
It has not to be not even a stationary point. It has to be a moment in time. Okay? So it is still quite general. But I use something. I use the, this external potential. I have to be able to do all this derivative. So it has to be Taylor expandable, the external potential. It has to be time analytic, we say. Okay, so this is a condition for demonstrating the runge gross um, theorem. Okay? Let's go to the second part. Can we say that also the densities are different? Francesco, excuse yep. me, can I ask you a quick question about what you, you said? So if you want to study um, non-equilibrium physics, I mean physics out of equilibrium, the proof doesn't work anymore. You know, when you turn on uh, uh, like a perturbation with a discontinuity in a way. Yes. So um, you have to, uh, well, so for uh, the theorem to be demonstrated, indeed, you need something that is uh, Taylor expandable for this uh, general case. Yeah. However, uh there have been um several um extension to the taylor expandability in the case in which uh, you uh, are in a linear response so let's suppose that your potential is small but completely arbitrary it can be very pathological in space okay in that case, um, you can demonstrate that uh, if your response function is uh, uh, analytic, there is no problem. In the case the response function is also non-analytical, uh, there is a more recent uh, uh, demonstration by Van Leuven. It's enough that your... Um, that your um, um, external potential accept a Laplace transformation. So you must be able to do the integral over your external potential exponential minus st in oh. the t. If you can do that, if this uh, uh, Laplace transform uh, exists, also there is no need for the Taylor expandability. The, your uh, potential can be sudden, can be, uh, can, can be born uh, in a very pathological way. But okay. yes, in the general case, we are not able to demonstrate the Runge-Gross theorem without having the Taylor expandability for the external potential. Okay, I'm asking because I see lots of people using TDDFT for electron transport, for example, or in combination with green functions. And this can be a situation where you, you have a, a gate voltage that you introduce, like uh, you turn it on, and then you have a kind of discontinuity, I think, in the potential. So this is why I was asking. Yeah, of course, uh, in, practical, uh, in practical application, in, I would say, 99% of the case, we use adiabatic approximations in, uh, for our uh, approach. Yeah. Well, in that case, it is also easily, is very, very easy to demonstrate because when you are in adiabatic approximation, we essentially um, uh, lose all the um, information about the initial state and the memory. So, all the, let's say, the sum rule about uh, the, 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 the memory are automatically, um, uh, automatically fulfilled because there is no memory. Well, also in that case, I think that the Taylor expandability is not a problem, but it's not for a generic situation. It's just for, because you are using the adiabatic approximation. Okay. So also in that case, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a problem, but uh, we are still looking for a, more general demonstration for the general case in which you don't do you don't put anything special on the on the potential if the potential is small so you can do that uh, the delta n is equal to a response function to 
the external perturbation, then you can use this formula and then you can read of the expandability of the external potential. Otherwise, we don't know. Okay, thank you very much. I'll let you continue the proof. Sorry for yeah. interrupting. Yeah. Okay, how to extend this um, uh, demonstration to the electron density? Well, um, we have to find the connection between the current density and the density. We know what it is. It is the continuity equation. So we can connect the current density with the time derivative of the density. And so we can use what we have used previously. That is the fact that the time derivative of two different current density will be different if we have two different external potential. So we can put this inside here and we obtain that the second time derivative of the density at t equals zero is equal or let's say related to the different of the external potential in zero. So again, if, two, if the two external potential are different in zero, the current density will diverge at an infinitesimal time after t equals zero. And this has to be, as we did before, has to be um, extended for all possible um, case, not only when the external potential are uh, equal in zero, but it could be that only the first derivative is different in zero, or the second, or the kth derivative. At a certain moment, there must be a k for which these two external potential are different. Sorry, here there is a prime missing. Um, and when that happens, it would be the k plus two time derivative for the density to be different from zero. And here, we have also a caveat, a little thing that we have to um, to pay attention. For the first part, we had the fact that uh, this uh, external potential has to be Taylor expandable, has to be time analytic. Need to be true also here. But here, you see that there is also a, a, thing, a thing more. And of course, this is true provided that this uh, divergence here does not vanish. Okay? So if two external potential are different, they will give a different density only if uh, these two potential are different, but the divergence of the difference is zero, because this will create these two being equal, and so we won't demonstrate the runge gross theorem. So there are um, uh, situations for physical potential this uh, doesn't happen, even though there are some uh, counter, uh, counter examples. And uh, for example, the the most known counter example is the fact that if you take uh, um, in a periodic system in a, in a static uh, electric field, this uh, wouldn't work. Okay? Well, actually, it would work only for a perturbation in, for a very macroscopic uh, electric field in which your, uh, your application is a Q equal zero, momentum transfer equal zero, and then it would work. But otherwise, it cannot be demonstrated in the full uh, generic case. For any finite system, for any molecules or atoms, uh, this divergence will not be a problem because uh, you will have a potential that uh, scales as one over R for uh, R going to, to infinity, so there is no problem. But otherwise, there might be pathological situation for which this uh, um, external potential might be such that even being different, uh, uh, the two external potential, the divergence will create it, the value uh, to vanish. And so we cannot be able, we are not able to demonstrate the difference of the two densities. But these are very specific cases. Okay? We, we won't be too much bothered about that, at least at this, uh, at this level. But be aware that there are caveats also, also here. Good. So the, uh, the connection between the external time-dependent perturbation and the density is a unique one. So we are able, definitely, to say that uh, uh, the, the time-dependent density 
describes the system. In principle, we don't need anything more than the density and the initial state to describe the full evolution of the system. So any, any observable can be, in principle, just a functional of the time-dependent density and the initial state for a given initial state. In order to do that, we have specified, of course, the side zero. We have to uh, consider the, the time analytic uh, uh, character of the extended potential, and we have this non-vanishing divergence. Okay? How do we do that, and now how do we tackle that in practice? Because one thing, as we've seen with the static DFT, is the theory, and one other is the practical application. So uh, there is no mystery here. We have to find some Konesham equations, as we did for the ecstatic case. And uh, finding this is very simple, uh, but we have to uh, start from the very beginning. So this is, there is a unique um, correspondence with an, ex an external potential and the density for a given uh, many body states uh, at t equals zero, okay? Um, you might have noticed that uh, so far, I haven't said anything anything at all about the system in question. For example, I always consider, and I think you also thinking about um, a system of electrons, but I've never explicitly used that, right? I've never specifically said that the system is in interaction with the Coulomb potential, for example, the electrons with electrons. And in fact, I didn't use it. This, I normally, uh, consider as it if, if it were the electron-electron interaction, but I haven't used it. So this is true for any electron-electron uh, uh, interaction. For example, why not consider the case in which I do not have any electron-electron interaction? So I consider now a system with no uh, particle interaction with no electron-electron interaction, and for which the Runge-Gross theorem has still to be true, right? So I have a certain potential that is in unique correspondence with the uh, time-dependent density, also for the case in which the electron do not interact, or if they could interact with another external potential, oh, sorry, with another electron-electron interaction. I could consider this with the Yukawa potential or with another uh, long-range potential, who cares, okay? So and here is the trick. I now consider another system, which, of course, you might recognize in middle as an auxiliary Konesham system of non-interacting electrons, for which there is a unique correspondence between the density and the external potential that now I call, unsurprisingly, Konesham potential, okay? There must be this unique correspondence because the Runge-Gross theorem is uh, okay, is, uh, is, has been demonstrated for any electron-electron interaction. Okay, so now my question is, how can I find uh, external, in this case, Konesham potential that is in unique correspondence with the density in which the density data I choose to treat is the same density of the real interacting system. So I have an interacting system. Now I consider another auxiliary system. I consider the same, that has the same density for each point in space and time. And I want to know if this gives a, an, external, an external potential that actually creates this density. And this, of course, given a certain initial state. We won't be the same initial state of the real one. Of course, there are, I have a lot of liberty in choosing the, the Psi zero. It is enough that I have a Psi zero that gives the correct density at t equals zero but uh, I'm not full, right? And so I choose one that is convenient for me. 
And the one that is convenient for me is to choose a one particle set of uh, non-interacting uh, uh, electron to construct my many body initial state. So I choose, but I don't need to, but I want to choose the Slater determinant. Why not? It's so easy. So I choose a, an initial state in such a way that this gives the correct density at e equals zero. And that's my only requirement. Now I say, for the runge gross theorem, the Kohn-Sham potential that gives this density is unique. There cannot be two, because there cannot be two, two potential that gives the same density. So there will be only one. And since my system is composed by non-interacting electrons, uh, I know how to write the density in terms of the one particle um, wave function. That now depends on time. So if it exists, at the moment, I haven't said anything about the existence, but I know that if it exists for the runge gross theorem, it is unique. Let's stay at this for the moment. So I have a unique Kohn-Sham potential. How to write this Kohn-Sham potential that act on the non-interacting electrons? Well, I don't know it, of course. It is unknown, but I like to write it in a simple way. How, how do I write it? Well, first of all, I add and subtract the external potential of the acting on the real system, and I put it here. Then I add and extract, uh, sorry, add and subtract the Hartree potential that is now time dependent only because the density is time dependent. Okay, the Coulomb potential is still instantaneous. And then I put all the rest inside here. I don't know what it is. And I call it, of course, exchange correlation potential. Okay, so I just uh, know, I just know that this potential is unique if it exists. So the Kohn-Sham potential, since it acts, um, it will generate the non-interacting density, which is the same of the interacting density, is a function of the density, of course, and of the initial state. In this case, I chose it to be the psi zero, the Slater determinant. The external potential is also a function of the density and, well, um, implicit of the initial state. The Hartree potential is instantaneous. And in order to balance this, the exchange correlation potential has to be also a function of the density, but also of the full many body initial state and of the um, single particle initial state. I put in here everything that I don't know about this connection potential, but I know that it is unique and it uniquely gives the density the time-dependent density, okay? And so if I have the potential, well, now I can write the uh, Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation, I know how to write it, and the Schrodinger equation for inter non-interacting particles, I also know how to write. There is one equation for each of the electrons, and I label here with the symbol I, and so I have my uh, Kohn-Sham uh, equation simply deriving from the Runge-Gross theorem. Okay, let's uh, recapitulate this. We have found from the Runge-Gross theorem the Kohn-Sham equation. These are equations that are different from the static uh, Kohn-Sham equation. For example, you will see that uh, it's uh, one, um, uh, sorry, first order time differential, uh, um, differential equation unlike the second order in space differential equation of the, um, the static ones. Uh, here you will see maybe later on, but already now you see that uh, it's not really a self-consistent uh, uh, calculation that is required, even if in principle we could do it, but in practice we never do. So it's uh, not an equation to be solved in a self-consistent way. There is no variational principle. Here, the Kohn-Sham equation, they do not come from a minimization of a potential of a, of a functional, okay? There is no equivalent. Um, and we have this uh, nasty uh, object 
uh, the exchange correlation potential, which is unknown. It depends on the uh, time-dependent density. It is a functional of the density. Here, in addition to what we had already with the static case, the exchange correlation potential is local. We know in the sense that it acts locally on in our uh, uh, wave function. So in order to apply to the wave function in R and T, we need to know the potential in R and T only. So it is local in this respect, as it was the local for the static case. However, it is fully non-local from the functional point of view, like it was for the static case. In order to know Vxe in R, we need to know the density at all R, at all points, right? And the same things here in the time-dependent case. In order to know the potential at point T, we need to know the density at all previous time, not only at time t. So we need to know, say, this should be a function of the density at all times. And here comes the memory. And actually, we can see it also because it depends on the initial state. And memory or initial state is essentially the same thing. OK? And still, we have this problem. We already said it several times, if it exists. So if it is exist, this uh, Cornishan potential, and so the exchange correlation potential is unique. But uh, does it exist? This is the so-called non-interacting V-representability problem that we had already with the, with the static case. And Julian mentioned these things, how to, uh, to get along with that uh, already in the static case. Here, uh, I won't go into the details, but I would like at least um, um, to mention a theorem that is very, um, very often unaccredited for. It is the Van Leeuwen uh, theorem that indeed goes beyond the Runge-Gross uh, theorem. And sometimes it is mentioned only for that, but actually it does much more than that. The Runge-Gross uh, theorem is a sort of, uh, uh, comes out naturally from the Van Leeuwen theorem but also it gives the condition for the existence of the uh, exchange correlation for the Konechan potential, the time-dependent Konechan potential, and it also gives a procedural way to actually construct this uh, Konechan potential, okay? So I won't give the details here, but uh, uh, I uh, put the reference uh, here, uh, down here, and um, I would like to mention that uh, in order to demonstrate the Valoiven theorem, we need something a little bit more. So we have even more constraint uh, to get back to the question from, uh, from Manu. Um, we need the Taylor expandability. So we need the time analyticity for the external potential. Well, in order to demonstrate the Valoiven theorem, we need the time analyticity also for the density. So it is a little bit more constrained, but if we uh, accept this constraint, we do not only have the Runge-Gross theorem, we have the condition, and we have also the existence of the non-interacting Konechamp system. We know that uh, not only it is unique, but also exists. But, uh, well, for that, we need to accept this uh, extra constraint, okay? So we managed to uh, demonstrate the theorem and uh, we have some Konechame questions. So now what we have to do? Well, we have to do three things essentially. We have to devise an approximation because it is unknown. Well, this is what we already did for the static case. We have to solve the time-dependent Konechama equation. Here, it is worthwhile to mention at least uh, how do we tackle this, because uh, we said this is not the same as the uh, static Konechama. And afterwards, we can look at some observables, OK? Please interrupt me if you want to uh, uh, comment on that, OK? Approximations. So here. The exchange correlation potential, now it is a nasty object because we have said it depends on the density in, in all places. 
Francesco, sorry, excuse me. Yep. Someone wrote a, a question in the chat box, so should I read it or? Okay, let me. What is the difference between the two starting points, Psi and Phi? Okay, we need two starting points in Koneshama equations. Okay. Yeah, well, of course, the notation might be uh, misleading sometimes. Um, um, so let me get back to. So here, what I said is that uh, I um, have the real system, and the real system has a, a certain external potential applied to it that gives a unique time dependent density. Okay? And this, of course, will have a different evolution depending on the initial point. Okay, so if I start from a situation in which the many body state was psi zero at t equals zero, I will have a certain evolution of the density when I apply an external potential. If I start from another psi zero, I will have another one. So always my situation, my evolution is determined not only by the external potential, but also by the initial point. Okay, now I say, can I try to have the parallel with the non-interacting electrons for this same problem? The answer is yes, and I have to do it like that. I will get another, another system which has non-interaction among the electrons. I will consider the same density evolution of the real system because this evolution comes from the external potential that I know, this is what I apply, this is what defines my problem. And I say, I have to start from a given starting point for the non-interacting situation. And I have a lot of liberty. My liberty is the fact that I just have to, to start from a certain state made by non-interacting electrons. So the Slater determinant is one possibility, but I have also had other one. For example, I could choose several Slater determinants, or I would, could choose something else. Uh, if, for example, if I don't care about electrons at all, I could even choose a non-antisymmetric wave function if I consider bosonic system, no? So the only requirement that I ask to this psi zero is the fact that has to give the correct density, okay? So this is my initial state. This is the equivalent of this state for the real system. Okay, of course, I don't know these things, right? I don't know exactly what are Psi 1, Psi 2, because in order to know, I have to solve the Koneshama equation. But this permits me to create the Koneshama equation. So, given time-dependent uh, time evolution of the density, I want to know what is the potential acting on non-interacting electrons that gives the same evolution, but starting from a certain Psi 0. So, in this respect, this... Uh, um, this uh, exchange and correlation potential is intrinsically a functional, sorry, depends on the density, depends on the initial state psi zero, because it is also here, and on the initial state phi zero. I can uh, actually also simplify this notation by doing a certain uh, um, consideration. And the consideration is uh, um, the, the following. Sorry, let me put this back. Okay. The uh, consideration is the following. Having a, an initial state dependence or a memory, we can demonstrate that it is exactly the same thing. So, because you can always think to shift back and forward the, the initial state and you will have the same evolution. So, you can consider this as a memory only problem, so as a functional only of the time dependent density, because it contains already also the initial dependence. This is from the mathematically um, um, correctness point of view, is a functional of n, psi zero, and phi zero. In practice, it means that the exchange correlation potential depends on the density at all times, previous times. Okay, so that's why we have it, this double uh, dependence. 
please let me know if uh, this uh, uh, at least answer even partially the question. Okay, great. Um, so we have to devise approximation for this because this is a nasty object and actually we don't know anything about it or we know a little bit about it. Of course, there are, like in the static case, a lot well, not a lot, but some uh, exact constraint, some asymptotic behavior. We have uh, some uh, rules to fulfill. Uh, there are less than the static case, but there are still some. And this constitutes an entire uh, full branch of research. And uh, we will not dwell into that uh, at the moment. But uh, first approximation that we can do, and it's of course, uh, uh, related to what we are doing, what we are um, discussing now with the question uh, posed by Diata, is uh, can we forget, first of all, about all this past dependence of the density in previous time? Let's suppose that uh, in order to know the exchange correlation potential at time t, we just need to know the density at time t. Still the full density, okay? The full profile for HR prime, but just at t equal t, not all previous part. So we just forget about the initial dependence all the previous time, okay? So this uh, approximation is called the living the present approximation or no grudge approximation. And for layman terms, it's sometimes called the adiabatic approximation, okay? So in the moment we do this adiabatic approximation, we are able to use essentially every approximation that we are used for the study case. Because we just care about what is the exchange and correlation potential as a function of the density. Which density? Well, the density at this moment. Okay? So we can use the adiabatic LDA. We can use the adiabatic GGA. We can also use the, all the orbital dependence, OAP, exact exchange, or the scan, what, what, whatever we want. Okay, once we decide that uh, we don't care about the past, we can use essentially all the approximation that we have used for the static case. And this represents the great, the vast majority of approximation in realistic calculation. Okay, but it doesn't mean that uh, we will never use a non adiabatic approximation. There are uh, several examples. We won't uh, do here a lot of examples, but one is the Vignale Con. Uh, uh, functional, that is indeed the non-adiabatic, but there have been uh, a lot of research in this uh, uh, for specific features like how to obtain double excitations, how to obtain a certain specific dependence on the initial state. So there are, it is a research line exploring better and better approximation, but I have to say for non-adiabatic, we are still at the level of model system or simple or simple situation uh, uh, to, to check still the approximation by itself. While for the adiabatic approximation, while we use LDA, GGA, we essentially perform calculation, TDD, FT uh, calculation for realistic system, thousands of atoms, many, many situations. Okay, so this is the bulk really of uh, approximation, and this is more at the research uh, level. Okay, so we have ideas about how to approximate, but we have to solve the time-dependent Koneshama equations, okay? And as I said, we don't do it as we do the, um, the static uh, Koneshama equation. In the static Koneshama equations, uh, once we have a guess for the either wave function or the density, we have our Hamiltonian, we diagonalize it, we obtain eigenvalues and eigenvectors. With the eigenvectors or with the wave function, we obtain the density. And the density can enter again in the potential. We have a new Hamiltonian to diagonalize again, and we go on. It's called the self-consistent field calculation. Okay? But this is cannot, well, not cannot, it could be used also for the time dependent situation, but in a very specific way, but it's never done. It is also very difficult, you can imagine, to guess a time dependent density uh, to be entered here and to, obtain, to be obtained again. Instead, what we do is essentially what we do for any kind of situation with which we have the quantum time dependent problem. We have to solve the um, the Schrodinger equation, okay? 
Here I put it schematically, like if we have one electron, so this is the case of the Koneshamm, we have to uh, solve this, uh, this situation. And what we like, what we would like, is to have the, the value of the wave function at times t once we know the wave function at the previous time, for example, at t0. This is the role of the so-called time evolution operator that takes as an ingredient the wave function at t0 and it gives the wave function at t. So it is a, an operator that depends on t and t0. Okay, you can easily check that if you put this psi t inside here, you obtain the equation for the time evolution operator, which unsurprisingly is the same for the wave function. So this is the equation for which, uh, to which the, the time evolution operator has to abide. And how do we solve that? Well, from the um, schematic point of view, it is very simple to solve this, um, to solve this um, equation. The schematic solution is this one. The u is equal to one minus i, the integral h times u again, the time evolution operator and in which I integrate the whole path between t0 and t. Okay, so schematically it's obvious. In practice, it's completely useless because I have the knowledge of u in terms of u itself. But uh, we have already seen that with the Green's function approach, uh, with, the, with the Xavier. Uh, this uh, kind of situation, uh, it asks for uh, putting the output inside the input and uh, uh, iterative this. And in fact, this is what we do. We put back the CU inside here, and we obtain the uh, second order term. So we have, if we put inside this U one minus the integral, we obtain the integral of H minus, uh, minus uh, the double integral, H times U, again. Well, uh, this is cannot stop here. We have to go to the second term and so on. And we put it infinite times. Okay. Here we just have to pay attention to one thing, which is the following. For example, let's focus on this um, on this term. All the same, all the terms are will be the same. Here, first I have to solve the integral between t zero and t one in d t two. And once I have it, I will have a function that depends only on tau one. And so I can do the integral between t zero and t. So there is an order in this, uh, in this um, uh, integration that I have to, to perform. Okay? So let's um, sum up all this because you see here I have one minus the integral of one h, a double integral of two h, triple integral of three h. So you guess the continuation, right? It will be a series in which n goes between 1, this is the first case, to infinity, in which I have many, many cases. Okay? And now here I'll do the trick. Instead of doing all this integral from a different, um, different uh, integration limit, because this is between t0 and tau1, then will be between t0 and tau2 up to t0 to tau n minus 1, what I will do, I will consider all these integrals between t0 and t, and I will insert here some heavy side function. And if I do that, since the heavy side will create um, a term with tau minus t1 uh, greater than 0 plus a term in which t minus t1 uh, smaller than 0 will create all this possible uh, situation. Actually, if I have n term, I will have n combinatorial um, uh, possible, uh, sorry, n uh, factorial combination. So I can write this with the time evolution operator that was introduced by, by Xavier, is the same one in which I have a commutator because this will have all the combination. And since I have n term, I will have n factorial uh, possible ordering, and I have to divide by n factorial. And the fact of writing this in this way is it's schematically, only schematically simple, because this is the uh, Taylor expansion of an exponential.
Okay? Don't be fooled, however. This way to write with this time evolution operator of the simple exponential is only a way to hide all the nastiness of these things. Okay? This is equivalent to this. It's not simple. It's not simpler. It's the same thing. Just that we can write it in this um, simple way. So, why we do we need all this? The reason why we need all this is because in our situation we have a time-dependent Hamiltonian. If we had the time-independent Hamiltonian, this would be just uh, minus h um, minus i times h times t minus t zero. But our Hamiltonian is depending on time. It's also not commuting with time, so I have to do the full uh, the full uh, time evolution operator, and this is again an entire um, branch of research to how to efficiently uh, calculate this object in order to apply to a wave function and to obtain the other wave function at a later time. Okay, so essentially here I mention only two two um, two aspects. We have two branch of research. In one, we consider this integral. How do we do efficiently this integral? Essentially, how to do in such a way this integral, and the way we do it is normally to consider in a very small amount of time the h independent of time. And we have all these kind of uh, um, uh, techniques. And then how we, uh, um, we, we treat the exponential of an operator, and we have again a different, uh, different techniques, how to either use the iterative technique or just to, to do the Taylor expansion of the exponential, so we have different things, and I like to cite this, um, this paper in which there is a compendium, there is a, a series of uh, explanation of all this method, the pros and cons of this, um, of this approach, but it becomes very, very technical now, okay? But let's suppose that now we know, and this is how it is uh, implemented in time-dependent DFT codes, really when done in time, the Konechham equations. And now we can do some observables. But since uh, I had to actually prepare a question for you, um, uh, to decide if we look to many observables just to skip to some more, but since it is already 320, we just skip them, definitely. And uh, we go directly to this point. How we create, how we um, use the Konechham equation to obtain some observables. And uh, I would say that 90% of the time-dependent EFT calculation is done to uh, create uh, some um, operator that depends on the density. So, for any observable that is a, a one particle operator, the relation with the density is very simple. We have seen this for the ground state, it's the same for the, um, for the time dependent case. So, one of these uh, operators is, for example, the dipole. And this gives the absorption spectrum. So what I do here to solve the Konechham equation, keep into memory the density at all time, and then I multiply prime the, the operator, for example, of an absorption um, uh, spectroscopy, which is the, in the dipole approximation just R along a certain direction, and I integrate uh, to obtain the um, the spectrum, sorry, here there is some, okay, sorry, this is the uh, photoabsorption cross-section and I do the Fourier transform to have it in frequency space and to obtain a spectrum, okay? And this can be done for any observable. This is the dipole uh, approximation. I can use, for example, the quadrupole of the octopole. Actually, I can put any multiple. I can propagate in time also the angular momentum to have something like the chirality of a, of a system. So I can do many, not many, but some observables. And let's see, let's see some results. So this is um, one of the first calculations done with a time-dependent DFT code, really with a time-dependent code. Um, uh, it was the code of, uh, of Yabana. 
And uh, here you see the spectrum. So this is in frequency because it has been already Fourier transformed in the frequency space of the benzene molecule. You see that there is a good match between the experimental uh, fragmentation experiment and the time dependent LDA. This is just ALDA, adiabatic LDA. Good result. Okay. Uh, let's go and see another one. This is a slightly more complicated uh, um, molecules. It is the chromophore of a protein. This is called the, the Green's fluorescent protein. And you have different protonation state. And again, you have um, a correct description, both from protonated and non-protonated state, with a good description between the, um, I think this is still LDA, but it wouldn't be very different if you use uh, GGA, time dependent GGA, uh, between theory and experiment. Okay. Uh, just another example, because this is not always how it works. Here I show just uh, very, very quickly the solid of argon. Uh, the experiment and the ALDA are not equal at all. So we will get back to this, um, to this point uh, in a moment. And especially in order to solve this, we will have to wait for next uh, week lecture because uh, the um, absorption of solid is still an open problem with the DDFT, at least not in principle, but in, in practice. And very often we have to tackle in Green's function approach again. Okay. So how did we do all this? We solved the Konesham equation in which we specify an external potential. And you can guess what is the external potential that we apply because here you see that we have a, um, um, a spectrum to all frequency. So we need to apply a certain external potential that is able to give um, a response to all frequency. Well, what we did is to apply for an external potential a delta kick in time. Very small. Okay? Very, very small. And so we kick in time at t equals zero, just a simple kick. And since this is the delta in t, it will be a constant in frequency, and so we can excite at the same time all the frequency. Okay, so this is what actually happens in practice with the time-dependent um, uh, code, the FT codes. Okay. Now you see that one of important point of this is this smallness factor here. I put, I said that this is uh, the external potential is just a. Uh, potential of the nuclei plus an external time-dependent perturbation that is small. It's a small kick. And uh, one question is, can we exploit this smallness? Can we exploit the fact that uh, eta is small? Because when eta is small, normally we, we always think about uh, perturbation theory, right? Can we use uh, perturbation theory and exploit this fact by more than just resolving the Konesham equation? This is the first question. And the second question that I would like to point to your attention is this. Here I put the, the spectrum also of another um, molecules, complicated. This is the absorption spectrum. And uh, when this uh, um, calculation has been done, has been done using some uh, quantum chemistry approach, and in which we do not have just the spectrum. What we have is really a full set of excitation energies of the system. Okay, so we have all these very sharp peaks that only when you broaden them out, when you convolute them with the Lorentzian, with the Gaussian, it will give the full spectrum. And indeed, for example, you can compare the spectrum with the, with the, uh, with the experiment. But you have also the excitation energies that can be actually solved in some approaches. And so the question is, can we also do that in TDTFT? Because after all, sometimes for little molecules, we want to know the excitation energies. How we do that? Well, to answer these questions, the first one, can we exploit the, the fact that the perturbation, the initial perturbation is very small? And can we access to excitation energies? And uh, what about other spectra? 
for example, in solids, there are really a lot of spectra that we would like to, to tackle. And all these spectroscopies, well, not all, but many of these spectroscopies are related to, um, to perturbation theory. How do we do that? Well, the answer to that is that we have to do a different approach. We have to do linear response approach. And this is another important uh, approach of the TDDFT. Sometimes people not even call it TDDFT, you just call it linear response and density functional, or linear response density functional uh, theory. Uh, we will see that it's very, very similar. It's just a question of nomenclature. We are talking about time-dependent DFT, but in the linear response approach. Uh, we have a different theoretical approach in the case of linear response. And um, um, ideally, since we are in a perturbative approach, maybe, just maybe, this is a question or other, we have an easier approach. We will see about that. And we want to have a practical scheme for, uh, for different spectra, and especially we want to know excitation energies. And I don't forget that excitation energies was the up the uh, application that you all, 90%, 98% of you, uh, mentioned as one problem to tackle in uh, TDDFT. So that's why I wanted to uh, get uh, quickly to this uh, and not to let you down. Okay? So, how we do TDDFT in linear response, or what does it mean? Well, in linear response, what we do is that we consider our external perturbation to be. Um, to be small. So what is this? So normally the external uh, potential is the, well, the external potential at t equals zero, for example, the position of the, of the nuclei that define our system, plus an extra perturbation in time. And um, uh, since the Vx is small, we can also consider that the density may be changed by a little bit. If the perturbation the system is small, maybe also the density, we can expand it in uh, with respect to the initial um, density, right? And indeed, if linear response is applicable, we have a linear relation between the external apply potential and the first order variation in the density. So this is the definition in some way of the linear response, okay? And the linear response um, is defined via the linear response function, chi, or polarizability, sometimes susceptibility, whatever you want to call it, is the function chi. That depends on t minus t prime, because time is homogeneous, and depends on r and r prime. We apply a perturbation in r prime, and we want to know the effect in the variation of the density in r. Okay, already here, you, you, you see something. Um, for this um, to be true, we have, we have defined a linear response function. Why it is called the linear? It is called linear because, you see, if you double the, the potential, you want to double the effect. If you do the Vx, you multiply times 2, this will be multiplied times 2, also the density, right? Because it's a linear related between the density and the external potential. So the chi doesn't depend on the external potential. The chi only depends on the system. So the chi, well, if it doesn't depend on the external potential, it cannot depend on the time-dependent density. And in fact, the chi cannot depend but only on the ground state density. The chi is something that depends on the system, it cannot depend on the potential applied. Otherwise, it won't be linear response. If this chi depends also on the x, it's not a linear response. So in linear response, we already know that there is maybe some simplification, because anyway, the quantity that we have to solve, for example, chi here, is a function of the density, but only of the ground state density. It cannot be of the time-dependent density. And the reason is obvious because we are perturbing the system, we are considering a perturbation so small in the limit of vanishing external perturbation that the density varies, yes, but the how it varies is related to just the ground state quantities. 
Okay? So if we are in linear response, we have to find this polarizability. We have to find a way to, to obtain this polarizability. Well, the polarizability is by definition a density-density response function here. So we have, we know actually how to construct this in the many body theory. It is a density density response function, so we get the commutator at t and t prime, and we do it. And again, here we see it in the definition, chi is taken with the ground state um, wave function, or at t equals zero anyway. Um, these are the density operator. Here, a little important point this is not the time dependent density, okay? Uh, I use the same notation explicitly because it is how you find it in, uh, also in the textbook that I mentioned. But these are not the time-dependent density. These are the density operator. So this is the density operator. And since the, our Hamiltonian is independent on time, the basic Hamiltonian, this, uh, the, the, the time evolution operator is simply like this. Okay? So I have the time-dependent operator. I can put it inside here, and I can find who is my polarizability. And why it is important, the polarizability? Because if I here now do a little bit of um, manipulation, mathematical manipulation, this is left as exercises. Um, and essentially, you can see how I do it. I insert the complete relation. I consider that the sum over all excited state psi i, psi i is equal to 1, and I inserted here and here, sorry, here, I obtain my polarizability in terms of the um, matrix element of the um, density operator between ground state and excited state, and I have here the eigenvalues of my Hamiltonian. E0 is the ground state, E i is the ith excited state. And by definition, Ei minus E0 is an excitation energy. So by construction, by definition, the polarizability contains in the poles the excitation energies. And this is exactly what we wanted at the very beginning. We wanted a, 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 a scheme, an approach, in which the excitation energies appear explicitly. Here they go. And so now we have simply to, to understand how we can calculate this without passing actually through all these uh, many body wave functions. We want to do that in DFT. So let me skip a little bit uh, um, this because I want to reach uh, the, the point in which we actually write uh, chi. So how we do that? Uh, first of all, we can consider that all these um, 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 quantity are related, so this um, chi is related to the dielectric function. The dielectric function is the one that appears in the constitutive equation in the Maxwell equation, d equal epsilon e, electric displacement, sorry, d equal epsilon to the minus one e, the electric displacement is equal to e, epsilon minus one to the times the electric field, so it's exactly the same that you can express in terms of fields or in terms of potentials, and is related to the chi. And by taking the imaginary part of epsilon minus one, you have the electron energy loss. By taking the imaginary part of epsilon, you have the absorption spectrum. By taking the real part plus the imaginary part, you will get the refraction index. You have really a lot of spectroscopy that are containing this epsilon. But this epsilon is also related to the chi that contains, as we know, the excitation energies. So, we actually have to calculate other epsilon or chi, and we have everything. And the question is how to calculate chi, but in density functional, not with the real full many body wave function, of course. Otherwise, well, we would have already solved the many body problem. Okay, in order to understand this, you can see several things. The first one in the case of an independent particle system, and here you get an int where we're going. We always consider this an independent particle system. My psi zero, my full many body, is easy to write. It will be a single determinant, right? And if it is a single determinant, for example, a single determinant um, obtained using DFT 
Konesham eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Why not? But you could use also Hartree-Fock or Hartree or whatever other single particle approach. You will um, uh, diagonalize your problem and you put your wave function here. So in the case of a single determinant, this uh, uh, um, equation, this, um, this um, structure for the chi will simplify in which uh, you have just the multiplication of four single particle wave functions and a denominator, the energy conservation, which uh, contains the, again, excitation energies for the independent particle system. For example, you obtain the homo lumo, considering that these are the occupation number. Okay? So we know how to write the chi, the polarizability, for an independent particle system, because we can solve the independent particle system, for example, using Konesham. We put the ingredients here, and we have solved the polarizability for an independent particle system. But, of course, what we want is chi. We don't want chi zero. Chi zero is okay. It's a starting point. But if we have chi zero, we can construct chi. How we do that? Well, consider this, um, um, this initial uh, uh, linear response function that we did at the beginning. The variation of the density is in the relation here, I put without all the indices and without the, the integral sign, is chi times the external potential. I can do the same for the non-interacting system. Variation of the density is equal to the polarizability of the independent particle system times a certain external potential that I will call here effective potential. And now I use density functional. I say that for each real system of interacting electrons, there exists a unique non-interacting system that has the same density as the real interacting one. So this delta n and delta n are the same. So I can put that chi zero delta v effective is equal to the chi delta v x, and this by using the density functional formalism. I know that if it exists, this is unique. And for many situations, it also exists. Okay? So this is a way to write the chi, the polarizability of the real system, in terms of the chi zero, the polarizability of the in non-interacting one. And now I have simply just to, um, to sort out all this uh, uh, potential variation. Well, we know it from the density functional theory that the total potential or the effective potential that acts on an independent particle system is given by the external potential that acts on the real one plus Hartree plus exchange correlation potential. And so I can put these things inside the effective potential. And I obtain the Dyson equation for the polarizability, in which V is the variation of the Hartree potential with respect to the density, and Fxe is equal to the uh, variation of the exchange correlation potential with respect to the density. I just did a simple uh, functional derivative to obtain chi in terms of chi naught times something. Okay, so if I have the polarizability of an independent particle system, I can find the polarizability of the real system solving the Dyson equation. And of course, as you know, this is known, this is a Coulomb interaction, but this is unknown because I don't know the exchange correlation potential. I will have to approximate. But this is what we do normally. So we start by evaluating chi zero, we define a functional um, approximation for the FXE, for example, putting to zero is called RPA. Using the same one that we have used for the ground state calculation is another possibility. Or we can use any other wave function, sorry, any other approximation for the exchange correlation kernel. Okay? Here we have a choice actually. We can either be coherent and go with the same approximation that we used for the ground state, or we can use another one. Okay? So these are the steps to produce um, um, a linear response TDDFT calculation. We start from a ground state one, we produce our uh, eigenvalues and eigenfunction. With those, we construct the chi zero. We solve the Dyson equation. 
to obtain the chi. And from chi, we can either get the excitation energies, not so simple, but uh, we can also get the, all the absorption uh, or other spectroscopy. This is the typical scaling of the approach. I won't mm, go too much in details for that. Well, in two weeks, um, Pierre-Francois Luz uh, will talk again about uh, scaling for this kind of approach, okay? Especially for the Bethesal Peter, which is similar to what we want to obtain now. Okay, just quick check on the chat. Okay, so if I didn't lose you so far, let me end up. Francesco? Yep. Can I ask you a quick question? Because, uh, so uh, Xavier talked about the non-self-consistent uh, green function calculations. And here in this context, we may wonder if, if we do a single shot, a bit in the spirit of G naught, W naught, how good or bad the results would be. Because usually we- You mean here? Up. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think it will be very bad. Okay. So, of course, it depends what you mean by that. So, if it really means to put in here just chi zero, yes. Well, in that case, it will be very bad. But of course, this is not really a problem in our situation. The Green's function has a, a lot of uh, non-analyticity and a lot of difficulties to, to deal with. But in our situation, this is um, actually um, very simple. I can uh, show you this uh, um, here, if you permit. Um, so here you have that um, chi is equal to chi zero plus chi zero something, I call it chi, k, chi. So what we do in this kind of uh, situation is always to solve formally for chi, and this is not a problem because this chi is always a function of frequency and a matrix in R, R prime, or G, G prime if we are in Fourier space, or even better in transition space, transition, transition prime. So it's always a matrix. And so this chi can be formally solved like one or delta minus chi zero k to the minus one times chi zero. And this is not worse than evaluating the chi zero itself. Unlike in the GW, here we don't have problems convolution in frequency that are involved if our k, especially if our k, is uh, um, the typical approximation that we have, adiabatical DA, GGA, or whatever. I hope this answered a little bit your question. And so yeah. it is so much better to solve this because it doesn't cost you much rather than going through Chi zero plus chi zero k chi zero plus chi zero k chi zero k chi zero and so on. Mm. This, I don't think it will ever, it would even converge in a, in a, in a, in a series. Yeah, okay. I was just wondering because sometimes I heard that like with green functions going beyond is not necessarily a good idea, but you said technically here there's no problem, so there's no, no. reason to, to no. trunk basically, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, actually what I would like to finish with is uh, by skipping the mathematical details is exactly how we do this um, uh, solution, this sky, so in the case of um, Mm, real space, you already see essentially the formula. It's the formula that I've written, uh, uh, that I've written down here, is exactly this formula here. This is how we solve it in our codes. We calculate the chi zero, in, which is a matrix in RR prime and a frequency uh, for each frequency. We construct uh, the delta minus chi zero times k, 
which is a matrix again in R, R prime for each frequency. We do the, ma uh, the matrix inversion or similar tricks. We multiply time chi zero again. We obtain chi. From chi, we get a macroscopic component. We get a spectrum. And that's it. This is essentially what we do if we want the spectra. If we want excitation energies, now, if we really want the excitation energies contained into chi, into the pulse of chi, here it's not obvious, but we can do it. And to do that, let me skip this. To obtain really these numbers in TDDFT, we have to slightly change the scheme. It is not to change the physics. They just change the, the ideas. And for those who already uh, know a little bit or at least have heard of the Casida equations, it's exactly what uh, we, we can do. It's a change of basis. We start from our uh, matrix in real space and frequency of omega, R and R prime, and we just change the basis in such a way to have an equation to diagonalize in which the diagonalization gives the excitation energies because we know that the chi here contains the excitation energies by definition how do we do that we have to change the basis so we take the matrix element of any function that we want for example the chi and the chi zero and the v and the fxg with four orbitals or four single particle wave function i j k l in two points r and r prime and we do the integral over r and r prime and of course this will become a function of i j k l okay and this uh, let me skip the mathematical details we obtain a matrix that for example the chi zero will be purely diagonal in this uh, space because you might remember that the chi zero was already four wave function now we put four other wave functions, we do the integral, we'll have a lot of delta functions, a lot of delta Kronecker, so it's essentially diagonal in this space. And we obtain the final result. We have this function, d chi, written in uh, uh, this space, in uh, this um, transition space, i, j, chi, l. We have a term, which is diagonal. We have another term, which is the matrix element of V plus FXE. Here I choose the adiabatic approximation. So the K that doesn't depend on frequency. This is what the Casida equation do, actually. They consider the adiabatic approximation. And now I have this problem. Chi is equal to an inverse of a matrix. And so that means that Chi can be written as one over a matrix minus omega, because here you see that the only place where omega appears, this is static, appears only here, only one place. And so this is typical situation in which I have to, to do the inverse of a matrix written like that. And this we know by mathematics how to do. We do it by diagonalize this matrix and put in the eigenvectors and eigenvalues here. And now the chi, you see, has exactly the shape of something in the numerator, something in the denominator, and the denominator contain the excitation energies because they are the poles of chi. So what I have to do is to construct this uh, TDDFT Hamiltonian, diagonalize it once because it's not depending on the frequency, put the eigenvectors here and the eigenvalues here and obtain my spectrum. But of course, I do not only obtain the spectrum, but I obtain single, single values for all the uh, excitation energies, all of them. And I can do analysis with it. This is the Hamiltonian that I have to diagonalize. And it has this structure. It has a block, another block, a block that is similar to the first to the second block, but it starts with the minus sign. And, um, and I have to diagonalize it, and I have um, something. You see that this matrix is not an admission, unfortunately. So you have left and right eigenvectors. Uh, sometimes it is done as an emission matrix, but in a different matrix. So really, 
I put this just to recall the Casilda equation if you already know it. Otherwise, you can stand with the, with the classical uh, equation to, to solve. Tandank of approximation when I simply do not consider the out of diagonal blocks. And in this case, I have only one type of eigenvectors. I don't have any overlap matrix. I don't have any left eigenvectors. I have only eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And I obtain a spectrum. And let me uh, get back to the kind of result that we, we, can, uh, we can obtain. For example, this is electron energy loss of graphite. Good with the RPA or GGA calculation, LDA calculation, all the same. I can do a adiabatic LDA of silicon, also good result. I go to absorption, wrong. This is always the case. We have already seen the absorption of uh, the solid of argon. Very bad result. And, and this is the recap. We can have, not always, but a very good result for absorption of simple molecules. Here, simple means uh, not too pathological, for example, not charge transfer excitation, not open shells, um, not too correlated, uh, and uh, also many other collective excitation for solids are very well described by simple approximation. And in the moment that I go to the absorption of solids, I obtain bad approximate, but the result for simple approximation. And there is a reason for that, is because the simple approximation, like RPA, does not consider any exchange correlation kernel, or it considers exchange correlation kernel starting from LDA or GGA, and they are all known to be with the wrong asymptotic behavior. They go to infinity, not like one over R, but in an exponential way, they decay too fast. And to show that, I can simply put and tune a kernel that is only 1 over r, or in reciprocal space, 1 over q squared. And if I do that, and I put just a kernel like this, and I tune it, I obtain this result, this black result, that compares well with the experiment, just by tuning, showing that this 1 over r is indeed the quantity that is missing to describe uh, optical absorption in um, in a correct way, okay? And this lack of one over R is the same problem for which we have a bad description, for example, of charge transfer excitation even in molecules that would not be described because charge transfer means transfer between a place and another place. And if I don't have the correct long range behavior between these two points, one over R, and I have a decay, exponential decay, well, they won't see each other in correct way. And so I will have a wrong wrong results. This is typical. What it is much um, uh, better described using the beta salpeter equation. Uh, in um, we will see this uh, next um, next week. Okay. So let me conclude. So in the linear response approach, we have some advantages over the uh, the purely time dependent evolution because we have direct access to the excitation uh, energies. We could also, when we think about the spectrum, we can build the spectrum frequency by frequency. For example, here we are um, interested to the first part of the spectrum, but then we can do it again for the second part of the spectrum. We can do that in this approach because we do it frequency by frequency. We don't have to evolute in time everything and then Fourier transform at the end. And we can do a lot of analysis, of course. Uh, we can change, we can anal analyze in each, uh, for example, frequency, what is the Kone-Sham excitation contribution. We can easily here say, what is the singlet or triplet excitation. We can see dark excitation. For example, if you look on the, the spectrum, we can only see the spectrum. But for example, here there is something, for example, what is these things? Well, it is an, an, an excitation that is almost, uh, almost dark, it doesn't have any weight. But even if the weight is zero, we still have the eigenvalues. So we can still analyze dark excitations. Okay, so we have a lot of advantage, but of course we have a lot of advantages also in the full time dependent case. Well, first of all, uh, has a 
counterbalance to this, uh, we don't have to do a spectrum frequency by frequency because once we have do we have, once we have done the time dependent, uh, we will obtain the full spectrum at once. We are not uh, um, restricted to linear effect. For example, um, um, second order or third order effect will be automatically included, while in the linear response we cannot. We have to go to the second order and create a new chi and a new chi zero, which is more complicated. Uh, actually, in terms of scaling the, the full time de dependent uh, Konishama equation are, have also a better scaling, okay? So um, I would like to end uh, uh, here. Um, so this is um, uh, a very brief, but still two hours long, sorry for that, uh, introduction to time dependent density functional theory. I wanted to cover both the theoretical side and the heaviness of the demonstration and the time dependent evolution for the um, for the standard canonical time dependent dft approach but also the linear response approach that made it so long because it is very very useful um, and for both communities we have seen i comes from the solid state physicist community in which use the linear response approach for uh, doing all this uh, spectra uh, and, uh, but also for the quantum chemistry, very often we are interested into very refined acceleration energies and these are also uh, very important. That's why I wanted to uh, stress a little bit on the linear response approach. Okay, so that's all folks. Thanks, uh, thank you for your, for your attention. Thank you very much, Francesco. Really, really nice. I enjoyed the lecture. <laughs> thank you. Yes very pe pedagogical and so on so thank you so much really okay so i don't know if there are more questions people thank you in the chat box you see it's raining thank you thank you yeah okay I don't know if, there, if there are uh, yeah if there are more, more questions or no mm. yeah it's already two hours i've yes. been quite long yeah okay oh, fine i mean it's uh, thank you so much for uh, mm. being pedagogical it's great yeah next um, next week uh, there will be a connection with uh, with this especially with the second part i've been very fast uh, and maybe a little bit uh, frustrating to go towards the excitation energies in um, uh, in the casida like uh, approach for the tddft but uh, we will take uh, back to this point uh, next week because the introduction of the bedesal peter will follow exactly the same path and we will see it uh, we will see it again and we can do the comparison between uh, tddft and the bedesal peter we just have a different kernel but uh, the equations are very very similar because they solve the same quantities the full polarizability the full chi yeah, and I, I guess Pierre Francois will cover that also for quantum chemistry. Exactly, and also from the numerical point of view. Yeah. Here I just mentioned very briefly the scaling, but the scaling is also a very important point, and it will be covered by Pierre Francois indeed. Okay, so Francesco, thanks again. Thank you very much. Yep. And uh, so bye bye everyone, and yep. uh, see you next week. Bye bye. Ciao. Ciao.